In order to get a better understanding of what it is like to work at a firm, you first have to understand that there are different types of firms and depending on what type of firm you work for, your experience may vary greatly when compared to the other types. Now generally speaking, you can group a firm by its size or by the type of work that they do. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But before we do, it's important that you understand what kind of work needs to be done in a firm before understanding how each type of firm handles the work. Generally speaking, work done in a firm can be divided into four phases, the schematic phase, the design development phase, the construction documents phase, and the construction administration phase. Now let's go over each one and see what they mean. Let's say that you, the architect, just got hired by a client to design a building. Let's say it's a house. After the contracts are signed and the agreements are made, you begin the schematic phase. The schematic phase is a phase where the initial design concepts are created and shown to the client for approval. Here you'll make preliminary plans or plans at a very basic level that show the overall idea of the design. Some of the deliverables might include floor plans, sections, elevations, sketches, diagrams, written descriptions, mass models by hand or digital, and basic renders. By the way, deliverables is just a term that literally means what you are providing to the client to communicate your work. This phase can tend to be a little complex sometimes because a client might not agree with some or all of the decisions that you have made and you will need to spend some time altering your design before it is accepted. Once your proposal is approved by the client, you move on to the next phase. In the design development phase, you'll spend your time defining the design that you and the client agreed on. Your deliverables might be similar to the ones you provided in the schematic phase, but now they are further defined. For example, in the schematic phase, you might have included a diagram showing the location of the program, but in the design development phase, you're starting to show what the actual design will look like and what each space will be made up of, including materials, doors, windows, so on and so forth. You, the architect, will be working with consultants that will design the structure, mechanical systems, and electrical and plumbing components. In this phase, those consultants will also have more defined systems that you will have to include in your design. In other words, the design development phase is a phase that, just like its name suggests, is used to develop the design further. You'll have multiple meetings with the client while defining your design to make sure that they are on board with it. Once they accept the proposed design during this phase, it's time to move on to the next phase called the construction documents phase. This phase doesn't necessarily mean that you're done designing, but instead it's a phase where you will tie most of the loose ends that you didn't during the first two phases. Here you're creating a set of plans and documents that will serve as a manual to be used to build the design. This set will ultimately be given to a contractor who will use a team to put together the building that you and your team have created. The last phase that we're gonna take a look at is the construction administration phase. During this phase, the contractor will work to complete building the project. It is common for the building team to have questions during this phase, and they will often contact the architect using something called an RFI, which simply stands for Request for Information. It is important that the RFIs are kept in writing for the safety of the parties involved. In the event of a change, say because of a mistake, a need for a change, or a client request, a change order will have to be filed. A change order is a document stating that a change will happen. It's important to know that when changes happen, they usually cost money. If changes happen in the schematic phase, for example, not much harm is done since everything is still on paper. But when changes are being made during constructions, there may be need to demolish work that has already been done and therefore will ultimately cost more money. That's why change orders are done and that's why they must be signed by the contractor and the owner of the project. In some cases, the architect will have to sign it as well. But in all cases, the architect has to be informed of the change that is happening. So now that you have a better understanding of what an architecture firm does during a project, let's take a look at the different types of firms that there are and how each of these firms handle each of the phases. We can divide architecture firms into two categories each having three subcategories. The first category is the size, and you have three types of firm sizes, small, medium, and large. This is pretty self-explanatory, so we'll just skim over that. The second category is the type of firm. There are efficiency, experience, and expertise type firms. So efficiency-based firms work on projects like parking garages, retail stores, and warehouses. 
They're able to develop designs and plans at a faster and less expensive rate. The experienced type work on projects like schools, museums, and hospitality related projects. They're able to use their experience to work on very complex program. Expertise type firms include, just like the name suggests, expertise in an architectural category. Zaha Hadid, Big, and Frank Gehry are three firms that could be considered expertise type firms. Clients tend to seek them out because of their expertise and ability to create unique projects. Before I get into how each of the firm handles the workload, a little disclaimer. I'm about to mention some stereotypes tied to each of these firms that I just mentioned. This doesn't mean that each firm will have the following characteristics. After all, they are all just stereotypes. So are you ready? A small firm might be made up of only the principal and a few drafters. Here, everyone will take a part in creating the work, but also help manage the firm. Everyone will help out in creating plans, renders, firm marketing, etc. These firms are great for recently graduated designers to learn about architecture because they will be exposed to more work and more different type of work. For example, you might be able to go on more site visits or help out in drafting up the typical details, pretty much anything that needs to be done to complete the project. Someone might say that a negative includes not having as much resources as the larger firms do and maybe not having as much job security either since the firm might not be as established to guarantee a constant stream of work. Then we have a large firm. You'll notice I skipped the medium, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Large firms are great because you might have more resources available to you, meaning that you might have things like health insurance provided, options for 401k. Some large firms even have fitness plans that offer discounts to gyms. Also, because there are more people in a large firm, it's easier for you to network and because the firm is so large, they tend to have better odds at winning projects that are more interesting. The cons you might experience from a large firm is that you might be stuck doing the same thing over and over and over again. Something that people often refer to as being pigeonholed, which doesn't sound too bad. And that might mean that you won't be learning as quickly as you would at a smaller firm, because in a larger firm, you might be only doing construction documents or specs or renders, which sounds cool at first, but believe me, it's not the only thing you wanna be doing forever, especially if you want to grow as an architect. Also, some might say it's harder to move up in this type of firm because you tend to have much more competition and it is much harder to stand out. And the third type, the mid-sized firm, well, you guessed it, it's the just right kind of firm in a way, meaning that there will be a balance of the pros and cons from the other two types of firms. This doesn't literally mean that it's the best kind of firm to work for, but it's a good starting place for new designers who aren't sure of what type of firm they want to work for in the future. Although I made this video to give you as much of an insight as I possibly could, there really is no better substitution than to actually experience it for yourself. What I mean is that if you're thinking about starting to study architecture, or maybe you're already taking architecture classes, it will definitely pay off to take a trip to your local architecture firm. And I don't mean actually one firm, I mean a few. Make a day out of it and go visit a few local firms. Tell them that you're studying or that you're thinking about studying architecture and would like to know more about what it is like to work at a firm. And doing this is great for two reasons. One. You get to find out what working in a firm is actually like, and then you can compare local firms to each other. Second reason is that you get to meet firms that might employ you one day. So technically you're networking. Believe me, I know it's nerve wracking and super scary to go out there and talk to architects without you yourself knowing anything about the career. But once you do it, you're gonna feel super empowered. Trust me. Something else you can do in the meantime is read about the actual practice of architecture. One great book that I always recommend is the AIA Architects Handbook of Professional Practice. This is a very expensive book, and I don't think you need to buy it, especially if you're at the beginning of your career. But I do recommend that you try to find an older edition for sale online at an affordable price, or maybe there's a copy at your university that you could check out. The reason this book is so great is because it allows you to look deeper as to what goes on in the firm, from managing it, to managing projects, to contracts, and much, much more. It's a very dense book, so don't race to finish it. Instead, read a few pages a day and try to learn something new each time you pick it up. 
On the other hand, if you want a book that's easy to read, short, and contains a lot of powerful information on your career as an architect, check out the conveniently titled book, Your Architecture Career by Gary Unger. I plan on doing an in-depth review on this book in the near future, but in the meantime, know that the first time I picked this book up, I couldn't set it down. It took me about a week to finish reading it, and that's because I'm a slow reader. What I love about this book is that it's meant to be used as a reference book, meaning you pick it up, see what stage in your career you are, and head over to that chapter. The book includes information about getting your first job, resume templates, excelling at your job, and eventually starting your own firm. Finally, I wanted to make this video because a lot of times students and young designers have this misconception about what architecture really is. When we're in school, we can be fooled into thinking that we're going to experience architecture the same way that we do in school. Then we get our first job and we find out that it's not really much like school at all. It's quite different. So I really wanted to make this video that would begin to explain what it is like to work at an architecture firm. If you work at a firm now, leave a comment with your experiences so that others may learn from you. As always, thank you for watching. If you have any questions or comments, make sure to drop them down there. See you down in the comments.